here we are, 10th anniversary. This book, The Pilgrim's Hawk, is one that um, I read years ago. I don't know how many of you came to our event with Werner Herzog when we were reading The Peregrine. So some of you are nodding. That's when I first um, became aware of the existence of this novel published by the New York Review of Books Classics, as was The Peregrine by J.A. Baker. And I, I was enthralled by it when I first read it. I think about 10 years, maybe seven years later, I was thinking about proposing it for another look. The first person I ran it by was Cynthia Haven, our tireless administrator of another look and very devoted for the last 10 years. She um, was very taken with it for reasons that she will share with us. And um, I reread it before passing it on. Then I reread it once again before tonight. So I've read it at least three times. And in each case, it seemed to me like I was reading a very different book because it is one of those kind of rare uh, novels. The other one that comes to my mind is Lolita, where every time you read it, it's like it's a completely different book that you're reading. The compression, the literary compression, the amount of, um, of um, it's, it's not symbolism, it's just the, the amount of narrative complexity and subtlety makes it an enormous challenge for literary scholars. And I hope that I'm certainly looking forward to tonight's discussion to find out how in dialogue with the discussants and with all of you, um, there might be insights and revelations about what this novel is really truly about. I'm very intrigued by the subtitle, A Love Story. I'm trying to figure out what that love story really, and where, where we have to locate it. So this is, uh, hold, hold tight, we will be discussing that. So we have three discussants tonight and I'm, we're gonna hear first from Cynthia Haven, again, you know, the Administrative Director of Entitled Opinions. She's a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar. Her most recent book is about Czeslo Milos, A California Life. Milos, the Polish Nobel Prize laureate who spent over, or more, 40 years. 40 years of his life, maybe over half of his life in California. Kind of else. E exactly, and this is, um, has been recently published by Heyday Books. Steve Wasserman is someone I'll mention. He is the chief uh, editor of Heyday Books. And um, this book was a finalist for the Northern California Book Award. She's published several books, including one that I've mentioned before in this venue, Evolution of Desire, A Life of René Girard, which was widely reviewed and it was named one of the top books of the year by the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, she has an anthology coming out very soon, I think with Penguin Classics called All Desire is a Desire for Being, Essential Writings for René Girard. And she's written for a number of venues the Times Literary Supplement, the New York Times Book Review, The Nation, Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and many others. So this is Cynthia Haven to whom we are all grateful for this 10 years of devotion to another. It's been a pleasure. After Cynthia, we're gonna hear from Steve Wasserman, Again, the editor of Heyday Books, which has published that, but he is a former editor at large of Yale University Press and the editorial director of the Times Books Random House uh, sector. He was a founder of the Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities at the University of Southern California. He worked for a decade as editor, chief editor of the Los Angeles Times Book Review and has written for many publications, including The Village Voice, Three Penny Review, The Nation, The New Republic, The American Conservative, The Progressive, Columbia Journalism Review, Los Angeles Times, and again, Times Literary Supplement. He is presently, as I mentioned, the editor of Heyday Books, which is an independent nonprofit publisher uh, located in Berkeley. And finally, we're going to hear from 
Tobias Wolf, who is one of America's best and best known writers. He's the author of, you know, classics like This Boy's Life and In Pharaoh's Army. He's well known to this audience since he is the founder of Another Look. And um, he directed it for three years before I took over from him. And I, might, I think I've said it on every occasion that I've introduced him. He's one of America's national treasures. So I would like to invite Cynthia to open our discussion of Glenn Westcott's novel, The Pilgrim Hawk, A Love Story. We've just come back from dinner together and um, I'm gonna introduce, introduce it, but I have to tell you, I tremble. I tremble. We had a lot of discussion and disagreements about what this book is about. <laughs> I've been asked to share a few words about Glenway Westcott's life. It's always risky to associate an author with his creation, all the more tricky when the book is written in first person. But in this case, the narrator Tower, he was pretty closely to Westcott's own life. How closely? Very. He's almost inviting us to make the comparison. The passing references would have been easy to fictionalize or dis disguise if Westcott had wished to. On page 21, he recalls, <clears throat> pardon me, I need water. He recalls, I had been born a poor boy on a Wisconsin farm. Doesn't sound like it. Um, so with Westcott, who was born on the family farm in Kowaskam, Wisconsin in 1901. He could easily have changed the reference to Iowa. He mentions living in a slum in Chicago, the same as Westcott, who studied at the University of Chicago, where he lived with his uncle on a 50 cents a day allowance. In Chicago, he hobnobbed with poet Eleanor Elizabeth Maddox Robert, and here's a Stanford connection, Ivor Winters. When the future Stanford poet critic was recovering from tuberculosis in New Mexico, Westcott was his secretary and companion. Winter's wife, the poet and novelist Janice Lewis, you remember her from 10 years ago when we featured her book on Martin Gare, uh, became a lifelong friend of his. Wallace Stevens read the 19-year-old Westcott's poems <laughs> and wrote to him. He wrote, it is difficult to make poetry as sophisticated as this fly but you certainly make it tremble and shake. I will watch your work with the greatest interest. That was a lot to live up to. And so it's a recipe for a writerly paralysis. He turned to fiction. That's why publisher Edwin Frank said in my interview with him, the Pilgrim Hawk is clearly enough about frustration in love and as a writer. In Pilgrim Hawk, Tower refers to his own failures as a writer. Quote, no one warned me that I really did not have talent enough. That's where the fictional Al Alwyn and the Tower <laughs> and the real Westcott Park Company. Somerset Maugham, as you may have heard on the clip, did warn him. He told Westcott he didn't think he had the talent to be anything more than an essay writer. And that was only if he put his back into it. Gertrude Stein weighed in with characteristic brevity. He has a certain syrup, but it does not pour. But there was a reason for his reserve, his withholding, a reason he didn't pour. He was writing as a closeted gay man. In 1940, when this book was published, he didn't have much alternative, at least not in print. That may account for his reticence in Pilgrim Hawk, it also explains why Tower and Alexandra never get together, which was something I puzzled about at first. <laughs> they seem such an obvious match. She is his great friend after all. Westcott's relationship with publisher Mon Monroe Wheeler started at 18 or 19 years old. They met that young and the relationship continued till his death in 1987. It was not a secret that the relationship was also shared with a third, the photographer George Platline for a decade or so. Westcott was a man very much loved, but Alwyn Tower, he's kind of an amiable outsider. 
Where did the money come from? Barbara Harrison, an heiress to a railroad fortune who lived in Paris, founded a small publishing house with Westcott's companion, Monroe Wheeler. And yes, she married Westcott's kid brother, Lloyd, a note, a note that is casually dropped on page three. Okay. I'm sorry. Can this is better? Okay. Is this better? I'm having trouble projecting. Okay. Shall I? Um, well, it was, that was another case. Can you hear me now? How's this? A little bit closer? Closer? Shall I put it in my mouth? <laughs> uh, it was another case where what well, Westcott's life was duplicated to a T. Harrison's fortune. Can you hear me now? Good. About 40 million in today's dollars is presumably where the money came from to support the expatriates. Although the match isn't exact, the narrator equals the author in other ways. Tower is an outsider, a reporter. Quote, even as he spoke, I hoped that I should be able to remember every word Alwyn says when he's listening to Larry Cullen. Author Westcott wrote way back in 1922, I have come to think of myself as a narrator. That is someone standing apart from the action. And yet he says passionately, how I hate desire, how I need pleasure, how I adore love, how difficult middle age must be. Michael Cunningham writes in the introduction, Tower sees too much and in seeing so clearly wants too little. He is the protagonist in the book. Yet Robert, Robert, pointed out to me that the name Tower doesn't appear through halfway through the book. The name Alwyn doesn't appear at all, <laughs> although it's in an earlier novel, The Grandmothers. An editorial oversight? Perhaps, but a telling one given the narrator's gift for self erasure. Count the triangles in the book, Madeline, Larry, and Lucy, Jean, Eva, and Rickard. Tower, Alex, and Tower's barely mentioned brother, and Lucy with everyone. Lucy is the only one whose desire is single-minded. This hawk's hunger was like an amorous appetite, says Tower. The subtitle is a love story. There seems to be much talk about love, but despite the triangles of sex, attraction, and jealousy, there's little real tenderness or affection anywhere. There's lots of jousting and manipulation and using third parties to generate romantic interest. And that is where I put on my hat as Rene Girard's biographer. The Westcott penned his novel two decades before Girard's landmark deceit desire in the novel about the nature of our wanting and our desire. When Eva is asked why she flirted with the chauffeur Ricketts, Ricketts when she loved Jean and wanted peace with him, she explains that when she flirts, it gave Jean, Jean a chance to become between her and his rival, which made her feel loved, and of course gives her the chance to yield to him, which assures him that she loved him. In other words, Eva feels more real when others are fighting for her. This is the very definition of Gerard's tri triangular desire, where a third party is needed to light your fire to make you feel wanted because other people are vying for you. We want something or someone because others want it. We want to be wanted. Larry Cullen is in the same competitive position with Madeline's Irish revolutionaries who drive him into rages. And Larry's infidelities drive Madeline wild. And yet competition fuels their possessiveness and passion. Now, others disagree with me, but the calm love and compatibility of Alexandra and Tower seem to me to be from another world. At one point where the Cullens are misbehaving, Alwyn says protectively, it was on Alex's count that I minded. Westcott Hughes to autobiography here too. I wonder if Alex's prototype may be the real life millionaires, Barbara Harrison Westcott, his sister-in-law, or perhaps a composite. I found an interesting footnote to his Westcott's love life. 
As a young man, Westcott wrote a poem called The Chaste Lovers, apparently referring to a platonic relationship or engagement he had from 1918 to 1921 in Chicago. He said, I must have written 50 poems to her and daily letters over a long period of time. He said that to an interviewer in 1976, but he was recalling it, you know, more than half a century later after life had taken him in a very different direction. Not quite Petrarch and Laura, but 50 poems. How many of you got 50 poems? <laughs> I wondered if she was the unremembered model for young Alwyn's great friend, Alex. His last novel, Apartment in Athens, was published in 1945. No one knows why he stopped writing them, though he lived till 1987. He published the volume of essays Somerset Mom had predicted for him, Images of Truth, in 1962. It was his final book. Okay. Mike, thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to confess, I'm almost entirely uninterested in the actual life of Glenway Westcott. <laughs> but I thank you for the research and the intermittently interesting, if not entirely revelatory detail. I think it a category error to try to tether as if the life of the author was a pilgrim hawk, which needed to be hooded and tethered to the wrist of a scholarly inquiry before let loose to die for the actual bird of prey at which we all batten upon. And that is the corpse of the book itself, which is both confounding, paradoxical, full of life, and as the only part of Glenway Westcott's sensibility that interests me at all is the homosexuality. Because I think one of the keys to unlocking this uh, book, and here I put myself on a limb which you're free to saw off, um, the key to uh, unlocking its temperament and sensibility is the degree to which he dipped his quill into the inkwell of his own gayness. That is to say, there is an attitude toward love and to armoring oneself to the promiscuous imagination which informs the writing and the sentences and the fear of commitment and the suspicion of love uh, which causes him to render a verdict on the reckless passions of the characters he puts out on the stage with a degree of unsentimentality and a rigor that largely eludes uh, those of the um, uh, heterosexual persuasion who are beclouded by the passions that they often engage in. And it is the very closeted nature of Westcott's uh, uh, life that gives him a purchase. When he writes in the book that all life is a perch, when he is a kind of bystander and spectator at the drama that unfolds uh, around him, he is adopting a, a, a particular sensibility which removes him curiously from the action. The audacity of Westcott to have, as it were, uh, put the hawk itself as a kind of gun on the mantelpiece which must go off is both obvious, daring, reckless itself, and uh, burdensome. Um, this is a story as if written, if Chekhov had been gay, this might have been the story he would have written. What interests me is not only the sentences that have been constructed and the characters inscribed, but like any great writer, it's the story between the sentences. It's the things that are not said. It's the things that the characters speak, which only allude to the story beneath the story. The audacity of Westcott to declare almost aphoristically from time to time with great Olympian certainty, wonderful uh, judgments uh, that, he, that, that, that are rooted in a kind of um, unearned presumption is quite breathtaking. I mean, we have, he, he writes at one point, love itself is an exaggeration and very likely to lead to others. What exactly does he mean by that? Um, he uh, dismisses, um, he says, sometimes I am as sensitive as a woman to others temper or temperament. And it is a kind of sensitivity which may turn almost by chance for them or against them. 
There is a kind of sadism that runs throughout the text. He says at one point, my malice was beginning to keep pace with my companion's folly. Um, at another juncture, he says, um, uh, he, 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 he talks about what he describes as a fond anxiety. And finally, he, he, he refers to um, a interesting verdict, which he says, I reminded myself that on the whole, throughout life as a whole, the appetites which do not arise until we have resolved to eat, which we cannot comprehend until we have eaten, are the noblest, marital, aesthetic, religious. We have in the confines of barely a little over 100 pages, an entire philosophy, entire sensibility in which the figures are moved about, notions, rationales, conceits are ascribed to them, but rarely actually justified, except mostly in the presumptive mind of the narrator, who is himself finally, and this is the best hat trick of all, exemplary, I would say, uh, to conclude, but maybe I was wrong about it all. So what he giveth, he taketh back at the very end in a kind of sublime uh, gesture, which both uh, I think is a um, gesture which is a tribute to the presumptive intelligence of his readers, but also give us the, gives us the spectacle of a man who always wanted to have it both ways. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Is this, uh, can you hear? This book is not really derivative of Gatsby, but I can't help being reminded of it. Do uh, you remember that afternoon in Gatsby when they all go into New York and they're getting drunk? Or, and of course it leads to something later that's catastrophic that day, but that long, uh, sagging afternoon, alcohol-fueled, um, and uh, this long afternoon that, that Glenway Westcott has captured here uh, and gives the book so much of its power, the confinement of these people. Uh, they are in their own way as confined as that hawk on the glove. Uh, they're, they're stultified and uh, captive themselves. Um, and um, that comparison even reaches a little farther for me. Cullen was reminding me of somebody as I was reading this. And then I thought, thought Tom Buchanan, uh, he has that same bullish physique, the kind of bullying, assertive manner, the uncertainty about the uh, let's say, the inequality of affection between him and his wife. Um, and uh, so there was this, just a, a little suggestion of that other book without it being derivative, but, it, it, but there was something, there was an undercurrent there. Um, I love the way he has managed to, uh, uh, to, to hold our attention to this one afternoon, we, there are suggestions of the life in other time, in other places, but uh, I think a lot of the power of this novel comes from all the things he's given up, uh, all the explanations, all the uh, other kinds of background that he might have supplied them with, uh, incident, uh, his gaze is so tightly focused on these people at this moment. And, uh, and even in the, just the second paragraph, he gives such a picture of, of, a, of a certain kind of life, uh, or in the first paragraph, rather. Uh, they were on their way. Uh, uh, the Cullens were Irish, but it was in France that I met them and was able to form an impression of their love and their trouble. They were on their way to a property they had rented in Hungary. Um, so right away in the first sentence, there we have uh, you know three different places where these people live, and right away then we get this uh, vivid sense of these restless, unrooted people. Um, 
one of the ways in which uh, uh, Westcott keeps our, uh, our, 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 keeps us alert to this progressing afternoon is by this bird, the physical actuality of this bird. The people can become a little dull. The bird is never dull. And, uh, and the constant negotiations of relationships around the bird. And, um, uh, and, and it has this presence and it's an animal, savage, predatory presence in, in the novel, a, a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, that Rilke poem, uh, the, the uh, what's it, the panther, you know, or in one translation, some mighty will stands paralytically. And that's that bird on the, on the, on the wrist, uh, this, compre this compressed power. And uh, throughout this novel, as, as uh, uh, others have, have noticed, uh, everybody's looking out at something and, uh, you know, looking out the window, seeing, uh, um, Cullen cut the, the tether, uh, looking out at Jean and Ava. There's a, you know, people are walking the way that rather unkind way, an unkindness that he acknowledges that Tower observes Cullen getting progressively drunk and helping Cullen along in that way. Um, and uh, it reminded me of a, actually a line in a book about another hawk, um, the, the Goshawk by T.H. White, um, a nonfiction book uh, in which he describes taming a falcon. And uh, he says of his falcon, he said, it is the prerogative of the predator to regard. It is the prerogative of the predator to regard. And there is that sense of a predatory uh, uh, observation going on in here on the part of the narrator, um, and uh, which is matched by that regard of the bird. Um, the title, a love story. The uh, uh, the this you it is asking us what is this love that it's the story of. Uh, it is a it is a, a very qualified kind of love that emerges from this. It seems to take the form of uh, of, uh, of power of of a, of a will toward power over someone else, as in Cullen's case, for example, over his wife. Whereas, of course, we see that his wife has power over him, um, and. Uh, uh, and Tower seizes it by his act of almost predatory observation and his confession that he is cartooning uh, what he sees, that he is turning it into some kind of a caricature, uh, making his own meaning out of it, but owning it, mastering it, manning it, if you will, in that way, that experience. Uh, It, it, there is um, his, uh, I love his reflections on marriage, this unmarried man, but uh, the idea that if you've ever really known love, uh, well, you don't know the cost of it because you're going to pay for it the rest of your life then in a marriage uh, specifically, he calls it, uh, installment by installment, uh, the debt gets paid. Um, so the so the treatment of love uh, is deeply ironical, I think. Uh, very skeptical, in fact. Um, one might even ask if what what he really uh, whether he really thinks people can love the way he asks whether people can really be free. There's a whole conversation about freedom. And I think that it's related to the, to the, his meditations on love. Uh, are we really capable of freedom? Do we even really want it? 
and um, and I think that is something that we can talk about in uh, in relation to this title and the question of love that is uh, you know put before us in this novel. Well, that's great. I and you know you've raised all of you um, questions that also have been you know haunting me in my reading multiple readings of the novel. Um, one thing that the author or the narrator does to put us into a, a state of um, crisis as interpreters is towards the end where he says that it was an effort to compress the excessive details of the afternoon into an abstraction or two, a formula of a moral in order to store a way in my head for future use and yet leave room. So this idea that maybe all of us here on this panel are under some, we feel like we're under some obligation to compress into an abstraction what this story is really all about, while the story is about a narrator who keeps ascribing meaning to, and symbolic meaning as well as psychological meaning to um, the people and the bird that, he, that he's encountering. And then by the end, he has this self-realization that uh, this sort of ascription of symbolic meaning is, is devoured into the abyss of unknowability. Mm -hmm. That this is what Northrop Fry might have called a self-consuming artifact. Mm -hmm. Not the novel, a self-consuming attempt on the part of you know, uh, Alwyn to make sense of that afternoon. One, let me just say one thing I like about this novel is that it takes it has the Aristotelian unity of space and time. It takes place in one day, in one place, and you know, uh, in a specific year. It's not like all the Booker Prize winners these days, which begin in New York, you know, in contemporary times, go back a century to Egypt, and then go forward to Europe, and then you, know, you have multi generations, and you have no unity of space and time. This is completely compressed within uh, one day, and you know there's a lot going on. Now, um, Steve mentioned a fear of commitment. He began. I, I'm very curious how you began by saying you couldn't care less about the bi biography of the guy, but then you go on about you know that he he was a gay author. That's a biography that coming outside of the novel. It's not inside the novel. Yeah, we can detect traces of a homosexual uh, sensibility if you want, but we're getting that from the biography of it. I don't think there's a fear of commitment at all. I think it's exactly the opposite. He declares multiple times, but in particular, I'm remembering a moment when you know the uh, Cullen has let the uh, you know the bird go free, and he says, "I was really." wishing that Mrs. Cullen would get the bird back. And I have the quote here. I was really hoping that uh, Cullen would stay with Mrs. Cullen. Mm -hmm. And he says, let me see if I can find these quotes here uh, about, mm, perhaps I do not believe in liberty or I regard it as only episodic in life. When love itself is at stake, love of liberty as a rule is only fear of captivity. Now, if we're gonna to refer to the biography of Westcott, we're talking about a gay man decades before gay marriage was a possibility. And therefore, he is looking at an institution that exists for heterosexual couples, but not for gay couples. And in that sense, it becomes uh, a matter of speculation about whether he is in a situation where, you know, where, where you have gay love outside of the boundaries of institutional um, sort of consecration. It's all about consent. And consent in relationships is always taking place in the element of freedom. You're always free to leave and 
go elsewhere. This is the state of the falcon before the falcon is domesticated and manned. And he actually seems to me to yearn for a condition of institutional commitment, which will uh, provide a, a kind of uh, possibility of a love that uh, where as an, you know, he, he's also very conscious of his age. The older he gets, the more he's going to become like the falcon who keeps missing the target. You know, because this is one of the great anxieties in those days of, of um, gay relationships is that it's all it's very youth oriented and the older you get, the less your uh, possibilities of, of, you know, having a kind of stability and long term thing. So he ends up actually, um, I think, being very skeptical about uh, about freedom and so it's, I, I would say it's not a fear of commitment, but it's a yearning for a kind of commitment that would take place within the bounds of an institutional organization. But that's, again, speculation. Well, I think this is an extremely one-dimensional reading, uh, which uh, does uh, the author an injustice. Um, it flattens the notion and complexity of the book um, dramatically. How can you reconcile the argument you've just made with a passage in which he writes, then I lamented to myself, if your judgment is poor, you fall in love with those who could not possibly love you. If romance of the past has done you any harm, you will not be able to hold on to love when you do attain it. Your grasp of it will be out of alignment or pity or self-pity will have blunted your hand so that it makes no mark. Back you fly to your perch, ashamed as well as frustrated. Life is almost all perch. There is no nest and no one is with you on exactly the same rock or out on the same limb. The circumstances of passion are all too petty to be companionable. So there you sit and you try to sit still and doze and dream to save trouble. It is the kind of thing you have to keep quiet about for others sake. The Pilgrim Hawk is Glenway Westcott or Tower. That is the man. And perhaps the love story here, perhaps to borrow a leaf from your argument, is that the narrator, Tower, is a man who has written a peon to the seductions of captivity, but knows that to fully embrace captivity and mistake it for a personal liberation is to uh, confuse release with um, with genuine freedom, and that at the heart of the book is indeed an argument about the seductions, as you put it, an institution of marriage, which may or may, I mean, I, I think this is a very, very uh, flattened view of the nature of gay life from uh, the dawn of time to uh, the modern age, to, uh, uh, and we should be wary, including myself, of caricaturing the possibilities of entanglements and relationships, even constrained by a society that has yet to embrace in an open and explicit way and confer a degree of, of, uh, of acceptability upon uh, same-sex relationships. But it, his own sexuality, which does, it seems to me, without knowing anything, if one were not to know anything of Westcott's biography, is contained in the very syntax and grammar of the sentences he has written and the plights and predicaments he so well describes, uh, you can see that the perplexion of that predicament is the kind of thing that only someone who is perched as an other has an eye to see the um, ironies and paradoxes that so much accompany a plight that the others in the same room are unable to see as clearly as the narrator. Uh, I also do agree with you that part of the charm of, of the book is its afternoon. One could easily, or seemingly easily, maybe it would be very difficult actually, but I would love to see a stage play of this. Uh, uh, it would, and, and has it been made into a play or turned into a play? But, but one could easily imagine uh, uh, taking place uh, over the course of an after, afternoon. And in that sense, I think there's no, there is some real similarity, not only to the Gatsby story, but also to some of the work of Oscar Wilde uh, uh, in the sense of both the compression, the elegance, 
and the time frame in which uh, the characters move. Should we get our mic? Sorry, I just. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, see in it I didn't think about that this was a gay this was about gay men and this was a story uh I, I mean I didn't look up the author so I didn't know that but the literature from I mean from the words I from the novel I didn't see that and I might be the only one in here who did that but but I don't know uh what is it that made you think that this was um a homosexual uh man talking at this point, anyway, that's I I have uh, I I happen to know just because I don't know how I knew, but I knew that 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 uh, Westcott was gay, but I didn't think that necessarily had to do anything with the character of Tower. I thought he did a pretty good job of doing what writers do, which is creating another being that is not necessarily oneself and. Uh, no, I think that uh, that uh, towers towers uh, dilemma here is that he has already despaired of love before all this even starts. Uh, he has, as it were, seen through it, seen to his own satisfaction its futility mostly the cost that it exacts. And there's a weary remove from the possibility of love that where he has placed himself. And that enables the, a particular quality of observation that he has, uh, the regard of the predator, if you will, because he's going to make use of all this, being a, a novelist. Uh, but uh, uh, there is, Yes, the, the, the love story, that's why it seems so deeply ironic to me is that, uh, that, that this kind of love that's, that, he, that he sees playing out around him is something that he wants no part of anymore. And uh, anyway, that's... Why do you say he wants no part of it when he seems to... I, 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 in my view, he seems to yearn. Do you, do you think so? I really do. But he yearns for a stable commitment, a kind of uh, sanctification of a union that will, un until death do us part. That he believes in the institution of marriage in the sense that you, yes, you go through all the pain, you, you know what the price is, and yet, you persevere the way Mrs. Cullen, and he's hoping Mr. Cullen will stay together despite all the uh, tribulations and challenges that get in the way of um, maintaining, you know, a, a long-term commitment. So, hmm. Maria Elena, you have a How does that jive with, with, with a sentiment in which he writes, and highly sexed men, unless they give in and get married and stay married, more or less starved to death. Um, life goes on and on after one's luck has run out. The old bachelor is like an old hawk. There is not as much sweet safety in marriage as one hopes. Hunger and its twin, disgust, are in it too. Need and greed and passage of time. The punishment, of course, true love and lust are not the same. Neither are they inseparable nor indistinguishable. At any rate, um, I wonder, uh, about his commitment to an institution like that there's another quote which will go <laughs> which is part of the genius of the book in which at the end he takes it all back and introduces a question of doubt and throws it on you um which 
uh, again, th these, this particular reading is not the only one that's possible, and any book worth its salt has to be able to tumble through time, circumstance, as, and your own life, and what you bring to it, and what you extract from it. But uh, what we do know about this little book is it's a piece of uh, gold. It is a piece of literary ore that uh, still uh, has a radio radioactive core and uh, can be read with delight both uh, in the early 40s when it was published and uh, it ought to be read now and more widely uh, than it has. And uh, uh, every, every reading is, of course, always subjective. And, um, and uh, it's a, a joy to uh, uh, grapple with a text that, um, uh, can present itself in this really engaging way in which we can spend some time together thinking about um, what, what happened to us while we were reading it and what happened to the author and what really is the story that's being told. There's a wonderful moment where he, where he talks about uh, uh, the, uh, which, which I really love a lot. There's this passage um, in which he says, all, uh, it's fool, always foolish to expect simplicity. All one can do is substitute little facts for great speculations. And this book is nothing but a tissue of little facts and great speculation about the other characters. And then he writes little performances for immense desire and call this simplification. And then at the end, of course, gives a nod to the notion that, all of this might be might have been far more complex than even I had tumbled to. Maria Ella. Yeah, I wanted to jump into this argument because he makes the point that every great friendship is really a triangle. Um, so I'm agreeing with the both of you in the following sense. I read the 80% of the novel as in contempt for something that Prescott wants and he cannot have. And he starts out very early with. You know, the hawk is a symbol for sex. First hunger, then he, first hunger, then sex, then like five different things. But when he goes to sex, it's like, oh, and by the way, I will never have this. I will die alone and self-pity. And then he goes back to like looking at these people in a very uncharitable way and the combination of envy at the same time. It's like the fox and the grapes thing, I feel. And to me, they ain't like, all this content, I had to put it down twice, which never happens to me because I was like, okay, you're way too mean, too mean to the characters, right? The, the thing that reminds me of the great Gatsby is, you know, there is the observer narrator, which is detached mm -hmm. and which is kind of like looking down his nose at everybody else in the scene. And then 80% of the way through when they're drinking, when the two men are drinking, he spins it around and you see that he doesn't have contempt, he's more self loathing because he says, oh, yeah, I'm looking at these guys like a fool, but how many times have I been looked as a fool? So that is my interpretation of your guys' diatribe, diatribe. And then there is an interesting point that he doesn't use the word contempt, he uses the word disgust, but there is always this overlap of love and embarrassment. Like the woman who's madly in love with her husband and spends the day telling him to shut up. And you know, you start out with uh, something I very much related to. I don't know if you can all hear the accent and clearly not from here. He starts out uh, with the expert experience, you know, how you meet somebody that's from your country somewhere far away and within 30 minutes, your best friends. And then you get to know the person. And then you start uh, being a little embarrassed that you're associated with this person in a far away place. And so this, this overlap of like, attraction and embarrassment, I think goes, yeah. is, is a theme in the, in the novel. Everybody's nodding. I don't like you, but everybody agrees. Okay. Um, I just want to have would, a word. Would you, would you address the relationship between Lucy, which to me was fascinating, and Cullen's wife, um, symbolically or realistically, or how you saw that relationship? with this thing perched on her, you know, um, because I felt that the bird was so much a, an important part of this story, you know, and how it related to all these people, you know, a predator. Can I just take this occasion to say something uh, 
that will be that's coming from a falconer and an ornithologist Hans Hans Peter, who uh, with whom I was in a long communication when we were reading the Peregrine for the Werner Herzog event, and I had alerted him to this novel. So I have he's not here today. He's probably not even on Zoom because he doesn't know how to navigate that. But nevertheless, I have here some things that I want to quote from uh, what he wrote to me about the relationship between the falconer and the falcon, which I really believe that the subtitle of this novel, that the love story is not between husband and wife, it's not between Alex and the narrator, it's really between uh, Mrs. Cullen and, 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 and the bird. So he, uh, I mean, I don't know. He said, thank you for the information about what this book, of course, I Googled the book right away. And one of the Amazon reviewers writes, the love is a story of a triangle. Larry Cullen is in competition with a feathered being for his wife's affection, end quote. That part rings true. Falconry, in fact, is a kind of affliction that has broken up many a marriage, <laughs> though it is usually the husband whose love of hawks has no boundaries. Contributing to this obsession is the nature of peregrines. They appear aloof and usually calm and therefore seem more intelligent than they really are, which is why tower can project so much onto this creature. And of course, they are capable of the most extraordinary flight observed in birds. Their sky-spanning stoops. Here's an explanation of where the passion or the love passion between falconer and falcon arises. Their sky-spanning stoops seem to rend the very air. And while they are normally quiet creatures, the roar of their solid bodies hurtling down at prey can be heard from afar. No wonder that falconers often seem to live in a world of mythological creatures that manifest themselves in their charges. Peregrines are typically taught to wait on, that is to circle at some height above the falconer, waiting for game to be kicked up. Just about every falconer whose hawk waits on at about 500 feet will report to his or her friends that this pitch is actually 1,000 feet, or perhaps at the very limits of visibility. One English friend of mine describes his Merlin's chase after skylarks as reaching the very gates of heaven. That's the kind of thing. Now, one last quote. The relationship of a falconer of either sex has with his or her hawk is all consuming. The typical falconer venerates his or her raptor. A falconer will suffer extreme conditions while striving to retrieve a lost hawk, swimming icy rivers, night hikes through waist deep snow, et cetera. Failed marriages are very common among falconers <laughs> with the demise easily traced to one, too many hours spent in the field, two, failure to appear for meals, three, inordinate attention devoted to the hawk, namely near religion, strength, adulation, weathering, molting, supervision, etc. Money spent on expensive species of falcon, which may fly off or die suddenly from a disease. And finally, feathers and other debris left on the kitchen counter, etc. So, a lot of mute. Probably. Yes, a lot of mute. And this is this is the interesting thing. Ce n'est pas moi, c'est lui. He's the one saying this. Male falconers are babe magnets, a, phen a phenomenon observed worldwide. Beautiful women are unaccountably drawn to hawk-bearing men, even when such are a very humble appearance and intellect. Conversely, male fa female falconers do not attract particularly handsome men. On occasion, falconers may trade spouses or mates with, or mates with other falconers. The traded person becomes pre-adapted. He's not joking. He's... Some observers may object to the at times sanguinary coup de grace delivered to a prey item by a trained raptor assisted by the falconer. But this act is, after all, a natural event. Mrs. Cullen's treatment of her husband recalls such a dispatch, softened, however, by his appearing to be a bit of an oaf. So I wanted to, I could quote a lot from the correspondence, including how um, 
and I, I was really very sorry to learn that it's not at all the case that falcons in the wild die mostly of starvation. In fact, they hardly ever die of starvation. They die of, of many other causes. But this very in, humanly interesting hypothesis that after two attempts, uh, the third attempt, that they, they'll just uh, go to their perch and, and allow themselves to start out of shame and discouragement uh, you know, it's a beautiful idea, but apparently it doesn't correspond at all to falcon behavior. Uh, so thank you, Hans Peter. <laughs> I'm going backwards and I'm a little bit, Toby, you said about him creating um, another being with his, his work. And um, that's what puzzles me so much because he's so tethered from the very beginning of the book, first sentence, he tethers himself to Glenway Westcott. I mean, no, you can say that the persona that's- Wait a minute, the, oh, you mean Glenway Westcott tethers himself to the- To the, uh, to the narrator, yes. To the narrator? I mean, he identifies himself, he could have created the fictional query. I mean, you're a novelist, you can tell us why- Why well, why, what, why, why do you necessarily uh, make that correspondence? Uh, after the fact, when you, let, let's pretend which is the best way to read a novel, that this had washed up in a bottle. You have no idea who wrote it. You wouldn't make all uh, some of the suppositions that I think we, I, I've heard tonight about this character if you weren't forcing the connection with the, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, author. And no, I, think this, I think this novel succeeds absolutely on its own terms. Tower is a character unto himself. I think he's realized on the page and he is not necessarily the writer. Um, now, sometimes I, it's certainly true that write, writers will encourage an association uh, between the characters and themselves. Hemingway is a notorious and, uh, and repeated offender uh, in that way. He really wants to be taken for these these manly men that he writes about, that their mistresses and and heroism of various kinds. No question that he that he would not mind being taken for those characters. But I I think that that uh, Westcott was very mindful of uh, uh, of, of his responsibility as a writer to make a, a character independent of of himself. He may draw on himself, and is yeah. where else are we going to get? our knowledge of emotions and relationships but from our experience and but uh but I, I i think we do a disservice to the novel by forcing that connection so i guess i'm asking why did he make that choice to be, to situate the guy in wisconsin on a farm to situate him in chicago i'm sorry <laughs> i guess i'm asking why he made that choice in the first you know pan throughout the book to tether himself why didn't he create as a writer why did he make that choice do you think well no but when he wrote this he was not a famous writer people weren't going to make a, a, an automatic connection between this uh, this writer and a farm and I, I don't see why he wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, ha have to disguise those things because nobody knew about him anyway his personal life. Yeah. They're reading a character on the page and judging the character. Okay. I think independently of the writer, because you know, they didn't really they wouldn't have known all these things about him, the, the readers of that time. Okay. It just would have been so easy to make a character out of that rather than to to me it was kind of puzzling. Well, he may be in, I mean, I suppose, you know, and he may be inviting uh some association, but it does seem to me that the character succeeds on the page, uh, uh, qua character, not not just as a, a as you know a, a, an extension of the of the writer. I just it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to do, and I kept looking for the reason behind why he uh -huh. it why he way. would do it. Yeah, Cynthia is a biographer. You have to keep that in mind. <laughs> right, right. No, and he could have made other choices. I yes, he could. <laughs> Sorry, I want to come back to the question of the subtitle, the love story. But I think it's very, I also kind of was thinking that it was about Mrs. Cullen's love for the, for the hawk. 
but it's a very strange love situation in that the hawk is just a kind of a slave. I mean, the hawk has never had any choice in the matter and isn't choosing to be with Mrs. Cullen. She's just stuck there. And that seems like a very negative commentary on love if that's the love story. But that's where the Hans Peter quotes are very interesting because if uh, falconers can sacrifice their marriages out of this excessive love for their own raptors, that even though it's not reciprocal, it means that at least in a one way sense, that passion is very powerful. Hmm. The passion is the passion is very powerful. I don't understand. I've never, I've never, you know, manned a falcon, but but I, I have to take it. They, they, there must be some very strong, uh, you know. Yes, like the devotion a Ro an ancient Roman had to his slave, and the and the peons written to the love allegedly born toward the master by the slave. This is a very very twisted notion. He quotes Buffon uh, as saying uh, rather famously, only the individual hawk is a slave, the species is free. And Alexander uh, Henry uh, uh, has a repast which is quite wonderful. Oh dear, it's the opposite of human beings. We are slaves in the mass, aren't we? Only one man can hope to free himself one at a time, then another and another. But what a peculiar kind of love is it that has Mrs. Cullen uh, fall so enraptured, let us say, with the hawk on her arm as against the husband at her side, because the hawk seemingly uh, returns the love with a devotion that a human, an actual human counterpart cannot hope to have because she keeps the hawk hungry. She keeps the hawk hooded. She keeps the hawk tethered. Of course, the husband begins to suspect that the genuine passion in this relationship is with uh, a mammal, not himself. And so he, he, he harbors murder in his heart, and he wants to kill that fucking bird, and perhaps Mrs. Cullen at the same moment. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and this tower begins to tumble when the hood is taken off and he catches the bird's eye and he recognizes in the bird's indifferent eye a reflection of his own indifference. There's very powerful stuff here and, uh, and very, um, uh, but if I, just to speak as a, as a lowly reader, if this be love, keep it away from me. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I... Steve and I are are always on opposite sides of this issue. So let me just well, there would be say no that panel I'll, I'll, without a faux drama of, of some we, kind. We, so we 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 push the envelope. But the, the the notion of slavishness, I think, is belied by the fact that that Lucy can fly away, and in fact, the anxiety when she is set free is. Lu um, Mrs. Cullen's anxiety is, does Lucy love me enough or is she committed enough to me to come back? She has complete doubts about that. So the idea is that the falcon can actually escape at any moment. And uh, Hans Peter will also confirm that many times, uh, you know, the falconer will go out for days on end trying to find a falcon. So the, the possibility of escape is always there. She's equally anxious about her husband leaving her. She says that time and again at the end to her friend Alex, oh, I really hope he doesn't leave me. So Cullen, Mr. and uh, you know Lucy are in, in the same situation that they can both flee. How does she hold them? If they, she doesn't hold them captive as slaves, she holds them captive through enticement, which is something where she can never be completely That's sure called that they're soft not going power. To... <laughs> yes, uh, we have a, yeah, go ahead. So I, I uh, thought the, the love story was more ironic along the lines you suggested that it was not love for the bird, but a narcissism and that the bird was like the Irish revolutionaries. That's something that you could trot out to bring some uh, focus on yourself and that the bird would allow her to walk into a room and suddenly there would be a lot of attraction brought to her so that it, it was it was rooted in a narcissism. And I'd, I'd be curious if you had a sense that was evoked for me 
that the discussion of her relationship with the Irish revolutionaries was a little like Tom Wolfe's book, uh, Radical Chic. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone saw that same uh, component, but I just throw that out for your thoughts. There's also at the back. Toby, do you want to do you, do you know that book? I mean, or the Irish Republicans or some connection? I don't. I don't. I, I, I thought about it. I would, but I, I, I think you're referring to that hilarious essay of his at Leonard Bernstein's party. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it, it and it is funny. Uh, yes. Uh, and there's a, you know, uh, she that moment when um, the poet, the revolutionary poet McVoy is mentioned and Cullen brings it up. I mean, he's afraid of losing her too. Uh, and she said, well, could we not speak of that? You know, there's obviously a lot going on uh, in this story that is not made explicit, but we can feel it pulsing under the surface. And, um, but yeah, there, uh, you almost have the sense that this is one of those hobbies that uh, privileged people take up to keep their lives interesting, um, you know. Uh, and then they, what, what is it in Gatsby? Tom and Daisy, they break things and then move on. Uh, and maybe there's something of that here too. Um, just adding to the stories that are pulsing under the surface, I wanted to uh, throw in a curveball about um, why the hawk is named Lucy. Why is it that Mrs. Cullen is holding it and made an appearance at Alex's house? And also, what is Miss, Mrs. Cullen doing in Alex's bedroom when Lucy is sitting on the bench? Because when um, Mr. Towers runs into the house to tell what happened to, the, to Lucy, it is Alex who answers the door and Mrs. Cullen is in the bedroom. And also when they say goodbye, Mrs. Cullen is throwing herself on Alex to say goodbye and give her a kiss. And Alex is actually a little bit estranged and then the second time she wants to do that. This is just for attentive readers. How would you interpret that? Yeah, you know, you're right. There's, there's, a, there's a pocket of silence there, which, and I know that in the interview that you, you did with Edwin Frank, he, he, speak, he spoke about Alex's ambisexual nature. And I didn't understand why he, what on what evidence he was basing this claim yeah, but you could su you could have a moment of, of supposition that maybe something is taking place in that bedroom but on the other hand we'll never know because you know female intimacy doesn't necessarily mean ambisexualism right? so yeah uh, we do have um hello from <laughs> yes. uh, a question on the chat if i can yes um, please share that with you so or i guess um a comment. So Brigitte is sharing with us, I spent an extraordinary day in 1982 or so with Glenway in New York City when I was interviewing him about Janice Lewis Winters. He spent most of the time we had about six hours trying to convince me that what I really wanted to do was write a biography of Glenway Westcott. He was <laughs> charming and um, told me many stories about his relationship with Ivor Winters and Janet. The day ended at the New York City Ballet with Glenway sharing a great many gossipy stories about all the people he knew there. I'm sorry not to be here tonight, but it was happy to be here on Zoom. Thank you very much. Not much of a question, actually, in the end. But Who that is was... that? What's the name? <laughs> Brigitte Karnashan. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. And, and in fact, could I ask Robert Edgar if we can save the Q&A, the, the questions, even though we might not be able to uh, get to them all? Great, thank you. And um, I'm just gonna take this opportunity to tell the people in the ether that they can share their questions on chat if they would like to participate in the Q&A. Were there other questions I'm missing from the back here? take my mask off. I hate talking to myself. So um, I read the book totally naive without background on the author. And you could, I would definitely say that he was an outsider 
but I would say I, I was um, I looked at it sort of like the other gentleman was a um, sort of like this was a class distinction. He was the poor guy in the group. And he was looking at all these rich people, you know, Mrs. Cullen and her red Prada shoes trotting around with a falcon. But, you know, it's just totally ridiculous. And the, the love triangle, I don't even think it was, it's, 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 you know, I think there's a distinction between love and the institution we made up with marriage. And Mrs. Cullen was a poor person. She married a rich man. And there's this constant game, you know, they were hunters and, this hunting theme goes throughout the entire book with a falcon and the dead pigeons and decoys and this and that. And now it just seems like um, somebody else was meant, oh, maybe now Dr. Wolf was saying that is, uh, you know, what rich people do to make themselves feel like they have a pursuit. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I have to work for a job. These guys are kind of crazy. <laughs> Um, so I don't know, maybe somebody else felt that way. Well, there's w one thing that uh, that uh, my wife, Catherine, pointed out to me when she was reading the book uh, uh, that I had missed in, in reading it. Um, and that is the, you know, uh, the, the way this marriage is shown in the, in the novel, it would seem that Mrs. Cullen is dependent, that she was poor, he was rich. She depends on him for her shopping trips to Paris and, and London. In fact, there's a sentence in there where she, it says she had money of her own. Uh, that complicates the picture, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, it's a question uh, why these two facts should both be in this description of the characters uh, and how to reconcile those. That's a, that's, but but uh, it it does it does change the shading of that character and that relationship to think that she actually mm -hmm. has means to be independent. One comment I wanted to make, and is that it seems to me that when I began reading this, these people were very wealthy coming in here. They they gathered about, they went to expensive hotels. And as the book goes on, it's all unravels. So by the time three quarters of the book almost finished, they are people who, who have no money in a way. They go to different people's houses. They don't wanna to go to the, because their sons are using their money to use for hunting. And it's almost as though they're not, they're not who they seem at all from the beginning of the book. And I went, the change was wonderful. I mean, I thought that was, when I finished it, I thought this is quite a change. This is how we see people when we first meet them. She has a falcon. They have a beautiful people. They're, they're, they're go from home to home, but they do that because I think they're a little bit ne'er-do-well. I mean, they don't have, they don't stay at the Savoy. They're not staying at hotels. They're going to different people's homes. Well, he, the tower, makes the observation, uh, and in some ways, a good deal of the book could be said to be peeling back uh, and revealing what he says, uh, aristo aristocratic manners are intended to hide those odds and ends of mere human nature. So peeled back, they slowly but surely disclose themselves as prey to, to, to jealousies, uh, almost pagan notions of, of prey, captivity, lusts, which it, it is, he argues, it is the purpose of aristocratic manners to hide those things. And the ways in which those um, boil up, or as some other person uh, says at one point, it talks about, in, in a remarkable phrase, blood and honey. Okay. Um, so what's, what's, for me, one of the things that's very compelling about the novel is that blood leeches through the sentences, describing ostensibly this sort of you know, uh, this this afternoon of conviviality, a few drinks, uh, the, you know, of, of friendship, of introducing people. They're going to have a meal, and this oddity 
of, of the hawk. I, I can't resist but uh, but sharing with you. I, I once had, I wouldn't say a similar experience here, but um, many years ago when I was the editor of the LA Times Book Review, I was great friends with um, Kathleen Tynan. Uh, she would. Uh, she was married to Kenneth Tynan, the great drama critic, who I was privileged to know for a time until he died at the impossibly young age of 53. Um, and then uh, she was also great friends with the uh, director, Tony Richardson, uh, who you may remember as being the director of The Loved One and many other uh, movies. And he had been married to Vanessa Redgrave uh, and ultimately shed that marriage uh, and came out uh, as a gay man, and uh, he would ultimately suffer from uh, AIDS and would die of the of the disease. And I remember uh, accompanying her to visit the dying Richardson at his home in the Hollywood Hills. And we were ushered into his uh, home, and we were uh, a, a servant of some sort uh, opened the door, uh, a sort of man Friday, as it were, and and uh, and 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 walked us out onto the terrace where we found Tony uh, uh, lying upon a chaise lounge. Uh, and stretched out on his chest was an enormous parrot uh, with the head of the parrot uh, at his crotch and the legs of the parrot uh, and, and, and it was on its back. And Tony uh, greeted us without uh, stirring at all, but in a very slow and steady way was stroking the parrot. Um, uh, seemingly uh, much like the uh, bird here, it seemed to have a calming effect on the parrot. Uh, every now and then the parrot would turn its head and nibble what appeared to be in an affectionate way at Tony. Um, but the curious thing is that we uh, tried to uh, array ourselves around the chaise lounge and carry on a conversation and not one of us ever had uh, the gumption to ask Tony, what the hell is this parrot? Uh, uh, in fact, the parrot was, to mix a, a metaphor, or, you know, what the, par the, the parrot was the elephant in the room. Uh, <laughs> nobody had the uh, temerity to uh, recognize that there was this parrot there that was dominating the conversation without ever announcing itself. And uh, I thought it, when, I, when we left, I, I turned to Kathleen and I said, what was that all about? And she said, it gives him great comfort. Beyond that, I know nothing. <laughs> Well, this is hard to follow, but <laughs> um, I was kind of surprised when I turned to the last page and read the last lines. And um, Tower says, I, I mean, yeah, he um, quotes uh, Alex as saying, I envy the Collins, didn't you know? And I concluded from the look on her face that she herself did not quite know whether she meant it. And doesn't that sort of indicate his ambiguity as to, or his confusion as to what had been going on all afternoon. Like, I think so. This was, yeah. yeah. there is no answer. There is no good answer, I guess, to explaining the book. Yeah. Well, no, I was just remarking that he allies himself so closely with his own person in the first pages. And then the book ends with, you're no novelist, she said, but this is the book he's going to write. <laughs> So it kind of ties it up. Yeah, we haven't talked about Alex. I, I, I find that she is, uh, for me, a very un, uh, unlikable, and uh, not unlikable, it's too banal to say unlikable, but there's, there's something about her that's very miserly in her emotional lack of generosity. She is not giving, she, she, she's referred to as being passive, emotionally passive and um, it seems that she and the narrator share a certain icy detachment from others and that they are, you use that word predatory in relation to tower and she's not predatory in the same way but as soon as something threatens to affect her emotionally, she withdraws. And so this, um, there, there, there's something not quite there in her character that. Uh, that's the, that's the, I think the most generous way to read her in the novel, because I, uh, 
to see her as somehow deliberately withdrawing and everything. I, I think she's rather a cipher in the novel. She's the least realized character yeah. in the novel. Uh, right. She's left a little too blank for me. And that's why this last concluding sentence about did she mean it or she didn't mean it yeah. it's almost like is there a self there to mean something right. or not meaning maybe you, how, you, how could how with what materials could we right. get given to us in this novel could we even make a conjecture about that yeah well you say she's not giving but she's putting up with all these hangers on <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all these freeloaders are at her house <laughs> One of the things that, uh, I, you know, I don't want to lay too much history on this novel, but it was written in uh, the late 30s and published in 1940. And there is, uh, you know, there is, it's funny how reticent he is about what is going on in the time he's writing the novel, but he has a sentence in there about uh, the this these fields that are now owned by the foreigners. Yes. and clearly referred to referring to the German occupation, right. which was consummated in 1940. Right. And um, and also the rather dismissive uh, 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 tone in which they talk about their neighbor in Ireland, uh, Lord Bild, the Jew, yeah. as they call him. And they don't like their sons associating with him and hunting with him. Uh, there, are, there are just there's there's rumblings in this novel of of a, of a situation not yet there in 1929, but you feel its possibilities. Right, and even in 1940, it hadn't been completely realized as 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 the horror that it was to become. Right. In in a few years, but but the presence is there. In you know, in the same way that we have this char minor character Bidu who was the minister who owns, or he doesn't own, I think he's allowed to live in, in the chateau adjacent to the property mm -hmm. because he was a minister in the interwar period and he was very pro-democratic. He, he admires Alex because she's American. He thinks that he had promoted democratic values in France. And yet there's a suggestion that he is also a predator of sorts because his wife tells Alex, "Listen, uh, you don't don't accept his invitations to dinner because he has something about uh, his his old. He has these impossible desires, <laughs> impossible desires, and I don't know. It's it's all very sub, as you say. Everything has pockets of of suggestion without ever becoming explicit, and that's why you can read this so many times and and um, wonder." what is being left out of the explicit statement. When in thinking and thinking though about all that's left out, what is there is so palpably there. Yeah. It is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's everything that's so present that is there. For example, when uh, Tower is, I think, helping Cullen get drunk, not yeah, minding right. getting him drunk, uh, the discreet, you know, he's making these drinks in the shaker. Yeah. Uh, this vodka, uh, the Alexander. Pre-Bolshevik vodka. <laughs> Pre That's right, people. Pre-Bolshevik Pre vodka. Pre-Bolshevik vodka. And, but just the description of the, the marks that his fingers leave on the frost of the, of the metal shaker. It's so detailed that way. He really... Uh, he, he 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 puts you there. You you mm -hmm. you're in the room with these people and sense their changing moods, like the weather, and yeah. uh, and and that's one of the things that is so hard to do as a writer. Yeah. And, and and yet, as readers, that's what you know. We we enter that world and, and we are unaware of what it took to make it. Right. And and it's details like that. I think. So in some ways, some ways it's sort of marvelous to read this book as an invitation if you were an aspiring writer. So take a scene, an or, a, a seemingly ordinary scene from your life. A couple, maybe of your acquaintance, maybe you don't know them, they drop in on you for an afternoon. And what do you make of that afternoon? What really went on in there? And then make it up and then try to render it with this kind of detail. Uh, is just a great exercise because it compels you, as clearly Westcott 
uh, had a gift for and, and, and worked at to, um, to paint in those details and make them stand for something in and of themselves and then taken together for something even larger than just those, those <laughs> details. And uh, it's, it's a very exciting thing to do because it's given to every, it, well, storytelling isn't given to every one of us. Stories happen to every one of us, but not all of us are equally capable of telling them in so compelling a way. But it's a great exercise because it, 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 it uh, exercises that part of your eye and that part of your brain um, that calls upon you to pay attention. And it brings and it makes you uh, ardent about the, the world and think deeply about it. And that's one of the great pleasures of reading a story like that. You really plunged into this world and these characters and throughout from page to page as the accretion of detail occurs. And at the end of it, you're sort of turned inside out, see the world with new eyes and ask yourself as you think about it and wake up the next morning, what was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> which I can think of no higher praise for a work of literature. Yeah, and in fact, um, the novelists that I've known, with exceptions obviously, but the, there is a very um, ferocious, cannibalistic, vampiristic uh, relationship to their own experience as observers. Hmm. And Everything I remember- Everything is material. You know, they, and and so Al Tower, for example, who gets Cullen drunk, he is also very much in the figure of a novelist who is trying to find materials. What can he get the drunk in a state of drunkenness? What can he get this guy to reveal that will add to his story? I remember being invited. I, should I drop names? Like, yes. Of course. Could see. <laughs> one, one I was invited to a drop. You know, the the dean invited invited me I don't know why when Kutzi was here to and the guy did not say one word the whole evening but you could he see him listening to everything that was said and then months later a, a number of things that unfortunately I said at that conversation comes out in, in, in it but, but you know this is the novelist is a sponge and an absorber and a uh, uh, you know so, and beware of you know, what you say in the presence of novelists. William Gass had a meditation in Harper's years ago about memoirs. And he said, uh, he who writes his autobiography is already a monster. And uh, that can in some ways apply to novelists. As well, <laughs> yes. uh, no question, just ask their relatives. Yeah. <laughs> Who was it who said first the caretakers and then the biographers come to the, after the death of the person? Do we have so, one more question? Yeah, I just, okay. I got it here. This, so, you're, you so, get the last word. Oh, wow. Okay. So, well, I'm, I, I'm interested in your reaction to the following. Uh, when uh, essentially Mrs. Collin is unmasked, if you will, that is when she takes off her high heels and chases after the falcon, and there was this, there was this wonderful description of what she was like running and her hips and the, all, all that change. And then a little bit at the end also, when she comes back in and, and with the gun and, and and throws it away uh you know i i, I it's like there was a there's a whole nother person uh, down there that that we have not uh, found out anything about until that moment uh, anyway i was i was very struck by that i'm just interested in your reaction to that unmasking if you will yeah my feeling i don't know do you do you agree that Tower kind of admires her in that moment when she gets she's she's without her heels and and she has a she she has a toughness and a, and a kind of authenticity. Right. Uh, Absolutely. She she sheds her artificial accoutrements and ornamentations. Exactly. Yeah. And it breaks that tendency which he sees in himself. To cartoon people, yeah. to to make right. abstractions, right. conveniently right. uh, packaged abstractions yeah. of them, she breaks out of that at that moment. Yeah, that's what's so great about the, I think the the novel, as we I think we all agree that there's a, I, it's not the self-consuming art, but he he sets up all these cartoons 
and then he's the one to unmask them the the way the same way she takes off her heels you know, and, and she right. she reveals herself to be a, a rather tough uh, that's a great moment i'm glad you remember just remember to mention that that you know. Uh, just a quick aside, you mentioned this was like a play uh, earlier, and, uh, or you asked if it had been turned into a play. Uh, uh, that was my strong feeling. This, this is just like a very good play. And then I realized, wait a minute, there's a hawk here. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think that's essential. And, and I don't know, you know, I don't know how anybody could do that with a real hawk. Yeah. Yes, but the only question I would have for you there is if it is performed as a play, what you don't get are all this cogitations and analogies and correlations that the narrator is making, trying to ascribe meaning to what he's seeing. And it would be, I think, impossibly opaque to even imagine. Well, well of course it, it is in it. And that is why most of the movies made from books pale next to the book itself. But the challenge of the filmmaker is to render an image and from the outside, without being able to reveal the inside, to allow image and appearance and the actor's craft and their eyes to, to give the suggestion of everything that the narrator is making explicit. And in the hands of a very good filmmaker and very gifted actors, they can bring a quality to that. Uh, it won't be the same as the book but it might be very, very good. Think of, for example, a film that is marked more by its silences than its speech, the first film of Roman Polanski, Knife in the Water, uh, which is all in one afternoon, is a triangle. Uh, there isn't a hawk as such, but there is the boat. Well, thank you all for coming. We've uh, gone over time, which is a good sign.